what are you most excited to watch at the 2020 U.S. Open? I think the thing that that'll get our most of my attention, and I think the guys that worked on the project are the are the greens and the slopes and kind of the side slopes and kicker and backboards and and all of the stuff that uh, <clears throat> is now putting green that wasn't before and how the players utilize or do they not utilize it? Um, you know, I always love watching them play at Augusta National when they're using all these side slopes to feed shots off of or feed putts off of, and now I think the the restored greens at, at Wingfoot have that capability you know th- for them to be able to do that so I'll be curious to watch uh, what those effects are and, and not only on the shots that are hit but on the decision making for for recovery yeah the recovery ones should be really fun because it opens up a whole new dimension of a shot around the green that they wouldn't have had in 2006 that's true. And I think uh, what I love to see, and I think probably any golf course architect does, is when you give different options, which ones do they choose? Do they choose the straightforward, the one that's sort of, okay, point A to point B, or do they go from A to C to get to B? And I think that that can be sometimes that decision-making process can add to the uncertainty. And we all know that, you know, the best players in the world love to have certainty or at least a really good predictable outcome. And when you start to give them all different options, I think that there's the, then then the head game start. And I think Tillinghast was a genius at that. Walk us through how the West Course is routed within the 36 hole property at Winkfoot. It's it's an interesting configuration. You you think normally, okay, there's the east and the west, and they're just split into two, and one's over here and one's over there, but they're purposely intertwined. And when you look across the landscape, because the features are so similar and the landscape is fairly similar from one to the other, sometimes you get a little confused as to, okay, what hole is that? And then you see the flags, you know, the red ones on the east and the blue on the on the west. And so you get a sense for for how that works. But you've got basically the west, the the front nine is a counterclockwise loop. I mean, there's some change of direction in it, but it's just in essence a counterclockwise loop that goes out and it sits between the front nine on the east and the back nine on the east. And so it's sandwiched around. And then the back nine on the west is a clockwise loop. And it's against the heart, against the uh, southern boundary of the property, and then butts up against the back nine on on the east. So they definitely flow and and intermingle. And I think a lot of it had to do with, I'm sure, telling us desire to get the both 18th greens back to the clubhouse and and the the proximity and the way that that all works and obviously needing to uh, start and finish and figure well the east course is on the eastern side of the clubhouse one east and then ultimately you don't come back on nine but you come back on 10 and then you cross through the clubhouse so it's it's really pretty brilliant how he figured out how to make all of that fit on one property and and have them flow and work around each other instead of just saying okay i'm gonna keep them separate what are two specific holes uh, that we should keep a close eye on during coverage? Um, you know, it sounds counterintuitive in championship golf, but I think the first hole is going to be a, a crucial one. Uh, somebody I contributed to an article and they asked, you know, what are the most important shots at, at Wingfoot? And I said, it, and I wasn't joking, it's the third putt on the first hole because you're, it's going to happen. I mean, if you can get through four rounds of golf there and not three putt the first green, then you're you're probably going to really take a, an advantage on the field. And it's just, is that third putt, is it a kick in or is it a, you know, a three footer with a foot of break in it from the side or is it above it, you know, where you're worried about not going off the front? And so I think that first hole really sets the tone for the entire golf course. It's one of the more extreme putting surfaces. And I think it, if you walk off of there having three putted, God forbid four putt it, you know, then your, your, your circuits are a little bit wired differently. So it's a heck of a way to start, start a round of golf. And then I yeah. think, sorry. See, I mean, adding at just, it adds so much pressure to the tee shot because you want to be in the fairway so you can have some semblance of control on that approach shot. Because if you get in the wrong spot on that green, it's, you're just hoping that it hits the hole. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's just, that's wing foot with the, the pressures you face on that first hole. You know, it's one of those golf courses that applies the pressure from, from start to finish it really never lets you up. If you, if you get, you know, start off with a struggle uh, on the first hole. So I think 
combining that with the U.S. Open pressure is really going to be quite a test getting out the gates there. It's a tough test of golf. And I think the other whole one that I think we're, we're most proud of is 14. I think the way that that green complex has been restored and it has been um, you know, brought back into what Tilling has to imagine. We took the bunkers away that had been, been added to it from the front of the green. So now you've got this false front. You've got this beautifully skyline horizon line to the green you kind of feel like you're hitting you know with no support behind and a false front in front you really have to get the right club there and i think that the restoration of the the approach bunkers you know 25 yards short of the green is not something you typically see on on certainly on modern golf courses so i think that's a really nice little touch for for going uh, down that road as far as you know old school looking golf hole so i think that'll be one that I'll be keenly interested to see how it plays. I, you know, I don't know if that's going to be one of the deciding golf holes in, in the tournament, but for us architectural geeks, I think that'll be one to, that'll be fun to watch. It's a neat spot on that property too, because it kind of leads you right into the, the most dramatic pe- corner of the property. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, you, you're sitting, you're sitting up, you're kind of looking down and then you see 15 behind you. Uh, you can get a good look over at 16 and see what's going on. So yeah, it, it really is. It's it's one of those uh, ridge lines that you, that gives you a little bit of command over over the property, which I think is it's 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 a really cool spot on the sh- on on the course. Do you approach uh, restoration projects differently at the clubs you work at that are have championship aspirations, like a Wingfoot, or is it pretty much the same process? Um, as a you know club that is just looking to be a great members course. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I, you know, we try to approach it in a similar fashion, no matter what, because generally, first and foremost, what Jim Wagner and I always look at is is the old you know who what did the original architect do? And so, if it's Tillinghast, then we're going in that direction. If it's Rayner, we're going in that direction. So that settles a lot of the decision making. And as you know, those guys were great at creating golf courses that were playable and enjoyable and interesting for members, yet could be ramped up to from a championship standpoint. So I think first and foremost, we approach every restoration project along those lines that we want to take care of the original architecture first. Then we start to look at, okay, what what can we do to make this a little bit more demanding for a championship? Where can we add length where we don't disconnect the golf hole? You know, there's no, I hate it when you walk 80 or 90 yards back, it's because we could stick a tee back there. And then you walk those same 80 or 90 yards back to, to play the golf hole. While that's unfortunately necessary for modern championship golf, we try to limit that. I mean, there were opportunities where we could have gained another 30 or 40 yards, but it just would have been so disconnected. It just didn't make sense. And then we look at bunker locations. How can we, can we move them down range for, from a fairway perspective? is the landscape allow you to do it? I mean, you can move a bunker 80 yards downrange to get it at 340 off the tee, but if it's over the crest of a hill, then it doesn't accomplish anything. And it certainly isn't consistent with the original architect's thinking. So I think within the confines, first and foremost, of the trying to be true to the original architecture, then we we look at what we can do from a championship standpoint and try and push that a little bit further. But it's not something that certainly not a reason we choose a, a project and it's certainly not something that uh, first and foremost dominates our, our thought making process. It really is, is something that we just hope to maximize it that we can within the, the scale of the original golf course. With the wing foot uh, restoration, what were some of the, maybe one of the most challenging or rewarding aspects of the restoration when you finished it, you, you look back on it and really, uh, love what, how it turned out or think about how, how tough it was to get it to turn out the way it did. I, I think, you know, I've been looking at some of the drone shots, including the ones that, that you've, you've put up, which are great. And, and I, I love the shapes of the greens. They really have some, you know, some rectangular ones, some different odd shaped greens. And I know that we spent a ton of time working with Neil Regan, uh, the club historian and myself and Jim Wagner and Seamus Maley, all looking at how do we get those outlines to match up with the principally the 1929 U S open 
uh, put away this great set of aerial photographs with you know, Bobby Jones and Alice Spinoza shot by shot in the playoff. And it showed you know, where they hit it, what the result was, but it, it gave it the clearest view of the golf course. So I think some of those eccentric, really old school shaped greens, you know, I don't, I think we all associate that with, with McDonald and Rainer, more of the rectangular stuff and maybe some really old school Ross, but a lot of Tilly's greens there were, were squared off in particular in the front. So I think recapturing the, the size of the green pad, getting it back out to the edges and, and recapturing some of those fun shapes, I think it was a fairly significant accomplishment uh, from what we did, but it was also one of the more fun aspects of it. You know, I can't tell you how many times I'd go and paint, take the paint can and paint a line, and then we'd all look at it and kneel or, or shame us, like, no, that's not right. And then you go drag it out and then go back and paint it again or move it over six inches, trying to get it so that we could get everything just lined up. So it was, you know, we sweated the details on that. And I think as a result, we were really happy with the way it turned out. For anybody that remembers the 06 uh, US Open, they're going to see, uh, a pretty different uh, bunker style. Uh, I'm curious about the thought process on restoring the bunker shapes. And uh, is there anything unique about those Wingfoot West bunker shapes? I don't know if there's anything that unique about them. What we, what we tended to find was um, originally, you look at the opening day photographs of the golf course and the bunkers were primarily grass phase. I mean, it was significant, you know, because all of the, the green pads are perched up and the bunkers are cut into the sides. I don't know that that's unique, but I think that's the defining characteristic of, of the bunkers there is that they, they basically hold up the sides of these plateau greens. And when they were originally built, they were these really sharp grassy banks and it was pretty cool looking. It was certainly very dramatic, but between the time the course opened in 22, 23, and when they had the U.S. Open in 29, he had changed them to the flashed up bunker style that we see now. And so we really looked hard and, and fast at how we could replicate that type of look. They weren't the pristine sort of scalpel edged bunkers that, that a lot of people associate with winged foot or, or did over time. That was more of an, an evolved style. So we put some fine fescue around the edges. We tried to get them to where we were, you know, they, they have the ability ability to get a little hairy and, and get a little eyebrow on them. So I think characteristic of some of the older photographs that we saw. So I think getting them to be a little bit scruffy, yet still presenting them as, as morning tame and getting the sand flashes back up where we're telling has eventually moved them to uh, for 1929. We believe just looking at the photographs sort of presents the golf course a lot closer to to what Tillinghast had intended uh, than probably any any golfers in, in a long time have seen. Speaking of Tillinghast, uh, obviously this is one of his most famous courses, if not the most famous. Uh, what and you've worked on many of his, his greatest courses. What what uh, characteristics at Wingfoot West really embody him as an architect as you look at it? Well, I think, you know, he, he, there, he had a very specific, you know, set of, of directions, you know, build us, it's not politically correct, but build us a man-sized course and really a difficult and challenging golf course. And so I think he, he probably felt the freedom to go ahead and, and ratchet up the difficulty on it. And I think it's one of those things where he, he showed in my mind, the ability to create 36 distinctive and interesting and varied golf holes on a very similar piece of ground. I mean, there, there's some really nice sections to it. Like we, we mentioned, you know, the ridge on 14, looking down into 15 and the creek as it moves through. But by and large, the entire landscape at Wingfoot is fairly consistent from one side to the other. And so to create and to, to basically utilize the features and to create these varied green complexes to put in different bunker locations to embrace the more subtle topography and very and varied in different ways, I think is, is great. I mean, it's a testament to his ability. I, we, we, we joked around, I'm not sure, you know, when you try and build 36 holes in, in a very short period of time that you wouldn't just say, Oh, you know, let's just do that, do that again over here. And he didn't. Um, so I think that there's that up uh, that his creativity shows up very clearly at, at winged foot, which I think has always been a hallmark 
the trademark of his work. He's he was you know varied in presentation, varied in in severity, varied in eccentricity. Some of his golf courses are a little more understated than you know. You get some of the like you go over to Fenway and you see some of the greens that he built over there, and they're some of the most amazing pieces of work and, and definitely very eccentric and, and unique. And so I think he was, he was very adaptable. He would change the style. He would change the look. He would change whatever he was doing based on the site and what he felt was the best use of it. And, and like I said, at Wingfoot, he had a very, you know, very good set of directions uh, for how he wanted to go about it. And I think that that was one of the things that, you know, was really, was amazing to us having been fortunate enough to touch all 36 greens out on the golf course and all 36 holes to go through it and never once go, all right. Yeah. We saw that before. That's pretty, pretty impressive. I, yeah. I feel like that's one of the most challenging things as a, as an architect you probably face is when you even building 18 holes is to make sure that they're all varied and, and fresh ideas from, you know, one course to another and even within one course and to do 36 on the same property. And then you consider Quaker Ridge and Fenway, they're all unique across 72 holes within, you know, four square miles. Yeah, it is. And, and, I, and, you know, it's, it's not meant to be funny because it was in somewhat, some ways tragic, but, you know, he, a lot of people talk about, he obviously had issues with drinking and some people said, well, when he was on the wagon, his golf courses were a little bit more subdued. And when he wasn't, you know, he, when he was having a flask in the afternoon, he maybe had a little bit, uh, a little bit more creativity and character in it. And maybe that is part of why I don't think it was more just that the guy was genius. And he was able to figure out how to make all of that work and make it all fit together. Yeah. Um, so before we get you out of here, we, we need a prediction. What The weather looks like it's going to be pretty good, hopefully. Knock on wood. Yeah. What, what are we thinking for, for a winning score out there? So I think you know, a lot of, you know, we talk about the architecture, but in, in the not sexy stuff is, you know, they put miles and miles of drainage in underneath the golf course. And, and, you know, we obviously have sub air under the greens and their USGA construction, although they are, you know, the original POA bent mix on top of it. So they look old, which is really cool, uh, but they should perform new, which is great. So I mean, Steve Rabideau is one of the best superintendents in the world. Uh, given his abilities to, to, present that golf course. I think the way the members will be proud and the way the USGA will be proud. And, and I think there's been a lot of discussion over the last five or six years about sort of the loss of the traditional U S open setup and, you know, thick rough and narrow fairways and fast greens. I, I think we're going to see that at Wingfoot. So if I had to guess, I mean, those guys are still so, so good. I'd probably say maybe plus three would be a, a winning score. Um, which you know, that sounds astronomical, but it's basically, you know, somebody going out and shooting 70, 71, 71, 71. That'd be pretty good golf at Wingfoot. Yeah. Given the history, I mean, plus three would be a pretty good score out there. Um, given all the years of, of over par. So yeah. it's, uh, and I think that would make a lot of the, uh, us open traditionalists happy. Yeah, I think it would. I really do. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. And uh, we're really looking forward to watching this week. And I'm excited for everybody to get to see uh, Wingfoot, your work there and, uh, and, and those great greens uh, for four days. Yeah, me too. I am as well. Thanks for having me on, Andy. I appreciate it.